Now that I've got my YouTube studio exactly how I like it, I'm loving the way it's set up. It's time for us to pack everything up and move it all across the country. I'm being serious. We're gonna pack up Gene here, the little lab assistant, myself, Ruby, my partner, and all of these 3D printers. We're gonna be moving them from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where we've been based for years now, all the way 3,000 miles across the country, to the city of Bridges, the Rose City, Portland, Oregon. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I'm going to safely transport these 3D printers, because I've had them damaged from short trips around the block, let alone 3,000 miles in a moving van across the country. So let's get into it. As the move is coming up rapidly, time is limited. So I'm not gonna film boxing up every printer. We're gonna focus on just one machine because the steps will be largely the same on each of them. We're gonna be actually focusing on my Voron 2.4 as it's the most complete and arguably most complex machine we're gonna have to box up. But I wanted to talk about this LDO Trident 300 cube that I've been building first. I've been building this machine during live streams on the Mandic Labs channel, and we've made quite a bit of progress, but it's clearly incomplete at this point. So there's not so much weight on the tool head or various points to worry about here. But there is one thing we have to worry about on this machine that we don't have to worry about on my Voron 2.4, and that is the bed on it. On Trident, the bed travels up and down on the Z-axis for the build volume of the machine. And that means that you have a 10 millimeter thick piece of cast aluminum riding up and down on printed parts, on lead screws, and linear rails, all of which could be damaged in transit. On the Voron 2.4, the bed is rigidly mounted to the frame structure, so we're not gonna have to worry about that bouncing along for 3,000 miles. This, however, I am worried about. So on this machine and my Mercury 1.1, I'm going to remove the beds and crate these up separate from the machines, so now I have much less weight needing to be supported on the trip. With the bed out of this machine, we can move on to the star of the show, the Voron 2.4. After we talk about just how little time I currently have, so much so that I'm going to overlap here to tell you about today's video sponsor, Brilliant.org. The folks who have an online learning platform that allows you to learn at your own pace, even when you're on a time crunch. Brilliant is perfect for those of us constantly on the move and juggling multiple projects and responsibilities. You can pick up and leave off with their lessons at your convenience. What I love most about Brilliant is their hands-on, interactive approach to learning. Instead of passively watching videos, you get to actively engage with the material, making learning six times more effective. For example, their programming courses allow you to start coding from day one with built-in drag-and-drop editors. It's a fantastic way to build foundational skills and see immediate results. Plus, all their content is created by experts from institutions like MIT and Caltech, so you know you're getting the top-notch education. For somebody like me who struggles with staying focused on tasks, the gamification of the whole learning process with Brilliant is excellent. I get experience points. I feel like I've achieved something while I'm learning. And honestly, the mobile app makes it so easy that I'm gonna be able to learn on the road while we're going through this moving process. When we take a rest stop, I can load up their app and keep on learning. If you'd like to get started learning today, head to the link in the description below, brilliant.org slash mandic really. You get 30 days of premium access for free, and if you decide to stick with it, you'll get 20% off of premium annual subscription. So brilliant.org slash mandic really. Go check it out, and let's get back to building some crates. Now there are a handful of considerations we're gonna have to take into account with this machine in particular, and that's why I'm using it to demonstrate what I'm doing. The flying gantry design of the Voron 2.4, where the actual tool head and the X and Y axes travel up and down in the Z axis, means there's more moving parts in here than there are on some other machines. Those moving parts are the things we need to consider. Even just the slightest bit of movement over and over again, thousands of times can cause damage or catastrophic failure in parts. It doesn't take a lot of movement to create an issue. To hold things in place, I've designed a couple of 3D printed parts. Why not use a 3D printer to hold a 3D printer together? 
I designed a rail clamp piece that'll go on the front extrusions of this machine because they're accessible. The idea with this part is that it grabs the top and the bottom side of the rail carriage block so that it can't travel up and down. It uses a single M3 screw through it that will lock into the extrusion that holds that linear rail. So again, it can't go anywhere. To help aid in the strength of this, to have it hold up longer, I designed it to accept a couple of heat press inserts and a few screws. The only purpose that they are serving is to reinforce the part. They're actually not attaching anything, but those metal components into this plastic will give it a stronger design. Now on the rear of the flying gantry for the Z-axis back there, I could take the side panels off and use those same clips, but then I would have to pack the side panels. And I don't wanna do that. I wanna keep this as together as I can for transit. So I designed some of these printed pieces that are gonna go underneath of the flying gantry, and they were intended to clip on to the linear rails at the back of the machine. I didn't get the tolerances quite right, so they're really not clipping on nice. Instead, what I decided to do was rest the gantry down on them to a set height and then use a couple of zip ties on the belts for the Z-axis at the rear. When I tighten these on, they'll actually lock the teeth from the two separate sides of the belt together so that the belt can't move. Two of these on each belt should sufficiently hold the rear of this gantry in position and maybe actually act as a bit of a shock absorber since the belt will give a little bit as this is traveling down the road. With our Z-axis locked in place, we don't have to worry about it bouncing up and down, heading down the road. Now it's time to consider the tool head on the X gantry. I moved it from the middle position to the right rear of the chamber. The idea here is that the weight of the tool head, however insignificant it may seem, could be an issue in the middle of this gantry. Now, I didn't think about this till I recently saw a video from 24-7 Printing on the V-Core 4 500, where they shipped that with the tool head positioned in the middle of the X axis. Now, this extrusion feels strong in our hands, but a few hundred grams in the middle of this, at its weakest point, the middle of the span, bouncing down the road thousands and thousands of times really has the potential to cause maybe only a minor bend, but a bend in this. And when you're talking about 0.01 millimeters being the difference between a solid first layer and a bad one, that could really matter. To lock that tool head in position where I want it to stay for this trip, I'm not gonna bother packing foam around it or anything like that. I'm gonna use a maker's best friend, more zip ties. A zip tie around the X axis gantry to hold the belts tight against the linear rail, and then four zip ties on the belts as they travel forward and back on the Y axis. And this being a core XY machine means that once those belts are locked together, that tool head cannot move around. Now I've just got to remove the spool holder off of the side of the machine, and then I'm ready to start packing this thing up. <laughs> well, that was barely on there. Now it's time to actually take this thing over to the workshop side of the studio and build a wooden crate for it. Let's go. All right, now to build this crate, I've got wood from a couple of workbenches that I've already torn down in the studio. And that's what I'm gonna to use to build this because why go buy wood when I've got stuff I've gotta get rid of anyway. Of course, I need to start from the base and build my way up. The printer needs to sit on something solid and also have a way to secure it down to the crate so it's not bouncing around inside the box. And I'm actually quite lucky that this workbench top that I had on the toolboxes that were over here is just about the right depth for all of the machines that I'm gonna be crating up. So it's gonna be a great piece to cut down for bases for these crates. Now I measured my base to be just wider than this machine at its widest point. I don't intend to put any packing material in here. I'm just relying on the crate itself to protect the outside of the machine. For me, that happened to land at 20 inches wide. So I cross cut off a piece of plywood at that 20 inches. Then I had to grab a couple of two by fours and cut those down, but I actually had a pair from the workbench that were exactly 20 inches. Then I just had to mark where I wanted the feet and land on this base piece of plywood. In my case, it ended up being nine and three quarter inches off of the center point of this wood. And how I came to that measurement, we'll come to that in just a second. 
And really, that's all that's going to make up the base of this crate. So now I can drop the 3D printer on top of it and show you how I'm going to attach the printer to the base. I designed a printable bracket that's going to mount to the front and back of the machine and to its bottom extrusions and then screw down into the base of this thing to hold the machine down. Obviously, I have not used these yet, but I really think these printed mounts are going to work just fine. Let's get them installed and see. These hold down mounts are the reason for why the feet underneath the crate are where they are. I want the screw that's going to travel through this to go through the plywood and into the 2x4 underneath, not just into the plywood. Some folks may ask, why not throw a ratchet strap over the top of this thing and ratchet it down to the base? We're back to the concept of bending extrusions again. In the middle of this extrusion would be the best place to put a strap, and you'd be surprised the amount of force that a ratchet strap can put out. We try to keep the frames on these machines as square as we can. I'm not risking bending it. To continue the crate upward, we'll use a pair of thinner plywood side panels. Now, these are structural, but they're gonna get reinforced too. A pair of one, two, three blocks and a two by four will set my height up off of the workbench so hands can get underneath the crate once the side panels are screwed on. The two by fours that are actually gonna create the strength necessary to be able to stack things on top of this crate are cut to length and then screwed inside of those new plywood side panels to reinforce them and create the strength necessary for stacking. They also get screwed in from underneath to create a bit of triangulation and reinforcement to everything. With the side panels and reinforcements on, I can lower it down to the ground to get to the top panel that's going on it, which will be the same thicker plywood that the base was made of in case we want to stack things on top of here. I also put a couple little reinforcements, smaller blocks in there to rest this piece on top of a little bit better. A handful of two inch screws and then a couple of three inch screws to really drive down into the boards below will hold this all together and make it nice and strong so that the whole thing won't rack or shift around on me and can be solid to set things on top of or have things bounce off of. I have a bunch of this pegboard left over from one of the workbenches, so I decided to cut it down and use it to cap off the crate. I'm not too worried about overbuilding this crate. It's not gonna be getting shipped by some third party who's gonna to toss this thing around. I'm gonna have my hands on it the whole time. So I just want it so boxes or other things can't fall in and hit the machine. This is a lightweight option that'll still close in the, the box and provide a minor bit of additional structure to things, but mostly just protect the printer. And with that, I've got one fully crated up Voron. I just now only have to do it at least two more times, maybe more than that. But I do feel like there's a detail missing from this that we've got to add. With that oh so important detail added, we can consider this crate complete. Now, as I already said, this is not how I would build it if I was shipping this thing around the world or handing it off to FedEx for even five minutes. But in a situation like this, where I'll be driving the moving truck that I'll be there when it gets loaded into and loaded out of, I'm not worried about this. The whole point was just to have a secure way to tie it down in the truck without worrying about damaging the machine itself or having something else fall over and hit it. And I feel like I have achieved that pretty well. Now I just have to do it all over again for the Trident, Mercury 1.1, Reanimaker, and a pair of Voron Zeros. Whatever, this one's taken care of and this project is complete. I do have a full studio tour video coming out real soon that you folks might wanna check out. So if you're not already, get subscribed to ensure that you see that and to ensure your 3D prints don't fail. It's not a guarantee, but it can't hurt. See you folks in the new studio. Thank you.